first course was held on March the 25th, 1985, as one of three courses put in the calendar. The course was held at Charlestown in West Virginia at the Claymont Mansion. And uh, the demand was so great for these three courses that in the first year we had eight. Since then, there have been 34 courses held in North America, both on the East and the West Coasts. And, uh, and in England, we had a house for three years where crafties would come and make extended visits. In France, we've had several courses. Also one in Holland, several in Germany, one in Norway. We're returning to Switzerland shortly for our second course. And as we're speaking currently, this is our third course in Italy. The key experience for me as a musician was in 1967 when I'd driven home probably about one in the morning and I put the radio on and there was this unbelievable music on which was terrifying and I had no idea what it was. At the end of it there was this amazing wind up from strings and then this piano chord and what I'd heard was Sergeant Pepper but it had begun somewhere and I heard no beginning to it. And this piece of music terrified me and something opened up. Then at the same time, I became familiar with the Bartok string quartets and Hendrix, Are You Experienced? and the male blues breakers. And there was a power in all this music which was the same music, although it was spoken by different musicians with different dialects. But the music was the same and it was incredibly powerful. And I couldn't return to the life which was planned for me. I was just about to go to university and take a degree in estate management and take over my father's small real estate firm in Wimborne, Dorset, become an estate agent. And I'd been a dutiful son for a period of years, but at this point it was no longer possible for me to keep these two contradictory impulses going. So, what at the time would have been called jazz chops, and yet it had a determining rock background. And here were these characters, young English people from nowhere playing its stuff. The remarkable scrunch and power it was so physical. At the same time, you couldn't play stuff that difficult in the technical standards of the time without being on your feet. Also, I suppose you say it's kind of catchy. It was a bravura piece. Bravura piece. And to make it just a bit more tricky, we'd, we'd walk on stage and without making such sounds as plugging in the leads or warming up, 
we just count it and play it straight in. Well, things that difficult, you can't just begin with it. You have to build up through the evening and hit it. We begin with it. Visceral power, zonk, the democracy. But it, it wasn't quite that. And I'm thinking of the, the three main forms of King Crimson. It was more, it was more a functioning anarchism. Not an anarchy, where you have no ruler and it's a mess, but in anarchism where there is no ruler that each of the characters involved accept responsibility for themselves. So it's, it's a far more interesting experiment, uh, far more difficult, but potentially more alive. Hey, it was written by those people, for those people, with those people in mind. And bear in mind from the period 1969 to 1974, we weren't even paid wages. We weren't even paid for going on the road. The budgeting was nil for wages. I mean, it was a zero budget on wages. It wasn't even in the budget. It wasn't allowed for. So King Crimson was something which, if you wanted to be rich and famous, it kind of wasn't the best band in town. On the other hand, you would have opportunities to experiment with a way of living your life and playing your instrument and working with others and playing music to people that presented opportunities you would not get if you worked by the book. And if the question is, well, what was it like? Then the answer is it was real. more extensive touring, I became involved in a, a little bopping dance band called the League of Gentlemen. And then in 1981, the return of King Crimson for three years. Then in 1984, once again, a certain period of work in the marketplace had come to an end. And I went into retreat and allowed the future to present itself.
1984, uh, when I left public life as a working musician, the kind of equipment guitarists were looking at was MIDI interface synthesizers and so on. Now, seven years later, when I'm re-emerging, coming back into public life, guitarists have given this up by and large, and what they've done is look at very high quality um, analog and or digital effects which modify the guitar sound rather than uh, plugging into a, a MIDI interface and, and using a sound source which is outside the guitar as such a sample system, something like that. So what I'm doing at the moment is finding what equipment is available, which was never available before, that might be of some use to me. And I was one of the first in England to buy a Zoom, the new little Walkman-sized digital effects system. My only complaint with it is that they refuse to give me a professional rate at the time, I was one of the first to buy it, and they hadn't moved to giving professional rates. Phi, I say. And the next piece of equipment I bought was the Roland GP16, virtually as soon as it hit the market. And uh, I'm just about to look into other pieces of equipment. For example, um, TNC from Norway have some very good effects that I'm going to look at. In terms of amplification, I've been using the new Trace Acoustic, which is an amp designed specifically for the Ovation guitar and acoustic, amplifying acoustic guitars. But I'm using it both for acoustic amplification and as a pair of electric guitar amplifiers. So my current basic stack is a, a Zoom with an ART multiverb and uh, a Roland GP16 into a pair of trace acoustics with my Tokai Les Paul copy. Everyone together, please. C. G. D. A. 
P, G. Lay together, M. The new standard tuning. The tuning, if we want a historic note on the tuning. Now the question is, uh, where did you find this tuning? The better response to that question would be that the tuning found me, and it found me while lying sweating in the sauna of the Apple Health and Fitness Center in New York at Bleecker and Thompson. One morning about 10.30 in September 1983. And I'd had a dissatisfaction with the old standard tuning, tuning of E, A, D, G, B, E, a fairly arbitrary bodge, which seemed to have nothing other than, than tradition and history. So I'd come up with no solution to this dissatisfaction other than considering maybe the possibility of a, a seven-string guitar. But it wasn't a burning issue for me. And then here was this new tuning. Guitar craft is not a method. Guitar craft is a way of doing something. And if an instruction is given or an exercise is presented, then it's based upon a principle, if the exercise is sound. If we are making a demand of our hands, we would begin by bringing part of our attention to the left hand. So, if we bring, if we bring the left hand to the seventh position, to the fourth string, we might place all the fingers lightly touching the tips on the fourth string. Apply just as much pressure as is necessary to stop the string and then release it. So pressure, release. Pressure, release. Pressure, release. May we all play, please, the first primary exercise. It'll be like this. Would you like it electrically? Yes, please. Here we go. Would you like to turn up? Two, three, four. one of the most powerful techniques we have in guitar craft. And on the outside, we, we seem to be passing a note to each other. But we, we might be trying to pass a quality of our relationship.
principle of succession states that in any ascending fingering, each of the preceding fingers remains in contact with the string and maintains the pressure. So, the pressure is not released until the fourth finger is in contact with the string. So, all the pressure is maintained. Then there's... And the principle within this is the principle of completion. Once the particular flow is completed, then the finger about to make the next move can continue on its way. There is another seemingly contradictory principle, which is the principle of constant release. In this, the pressure on each of the fingers is released consecutively. This is to exaggerate, another way of playing it. This, this principle takes precedent over the precedence over the principle of succession in extended fingering and in speed fingering, for example, rather... rather unpleasant fingerings like this. If you work in a group, something becomes possible which simply is not possible if you're on your own. Providing you can work as if you were one person. creative endeavor 
has to accept that the un uncertain is not only an inevitable part of what we're doing, but it's utterly necessary. In guitar craft, one of the, the ruling, guiding principles is act in accordance with where you are, when you are, with whomsoever you are. This is the first acoustic guitar which I've ever been able to play with any degree of comfort. The, the normal guitar, the traditional one, has a very wide shape. Makes the shoulder arm very uncomfortable and it also interrupts the 
operation of the wrist. So that the wrist will inevitably tend to bend and move more towards the center. My feeling is that guitars are made for guitar makers and not guitarists. And this particular guitar was made by a man who made helicopter blades for the American American Navy, the Bell helicopter. And having found the mathematics of this, he he thought, well, I should be able to apply the mathematics to building a perfect guitar. I'm not claiming that the guitar is perfect, but I am saying it's the first acoustic guitar that I've ever been able to play with any degree of comfort. The intonation is also better, the balance is better, and because of the, the pickups and the inbuilt electrics, it's neither an acoustic guitar nor an electric guitar, neither is it something in between, so it's an intriguing hybrid. It also has the advantage that it's mass-produced and readily available and playing in an, in an ensemble like this, the conformity between the instruments is very important.
it's a mistake to say that Ben. I was one of the players. I might have had a certain vision of something for the band. I, I mean, there would be remarkable experiences in the band. It was as if music leant over and took us into its confidence. beautiful little melodic line which comes in that even now it makes me ache I would love I would love to play that piece of music again love to it's in potential and the characters are in place for the next particular period of King Crimson's work <laughs> <laughs>